Now, it's my pleasure to invite to our stage, uh, or to the lectern, uh, our ministerial speaker, Victoria's Minister for Housing and Minister for Planning, the Honourable Richard Wynne. Before entering state politics, Minister Wynne was the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. He's now member... Of, come on up. <laughs> he's, the, he's, the, oh yeah, 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 come on. He's, he's the member for Melbourne, the member for Richmond and has previously held a range of ministerial portfolios, um, but really his passion for housing outcomes has, has shown through in his roles as Minister for Housing and Minister Planning. Please welcome Richard Wynne. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that um, kind uh, introduction. I wanted to start today, uh, firstly, by just spending a moment, if we can, to acknowledge uh, the, the community uh, and the country of the Ukraine, uh, who are suffering um, unspeakable um, violence at the moment. Uh, and I think for all of us, uh, particularly those of Ukrainian background, who, many of which, of course, people who do live uh, here uh, in Melbourne in particular, we have a very significant Ukrainian community here in Melbourne, uh, but also throughout Australia, that we, we spare a thought at the moment uh, for our friends in the, in the Ukraine. I mean, just this morning, I heard of uh, the bulletin this morning of um, children in the pediat pediatric hospital who were seeking to undergo their treatments who couldn't escape, who couldn't get down to the, to the bunker and safety. And uh, these, um, these crimes and these atrocities are almost un unspeakable. So perhaps we could just spend a moment just reflecting uh, on their suffering. Thanks very much. I also, of course, want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, the really significant um, challenges facing our countrymen and women in Queensland uh, and northern New South Wales at the moment with these, what are they, one in a hundred or one in five hundred floods that are occurring. I mean, massive loss of life that has occurred there. And uh, I can say that, as we always have done here in this country, uh, we pull together in these times of, of crisis, uh, and I can report that our government has sent 60 specialist uh, emergency services personnel, whether it's um, uh, flood, uh, flood Rescue, SES, uh, Victoria Police, to support our friends uh, in Queensland and New South Wales as well, and we, of course, think of them as well today. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for your, for your welcome. Um, can I say, of course, um, it's not unexpected uh, that an event like this uh, would, um, and we're delighted that we're hosting it in Melbourne, and of course, of course it's going to be the biggest event uh, in the housing calendar, because as we know, um, Victoria, I'll say, I say this with a level of humility, but with some confidence, has always led the way in terms of housing reform and housing policy and, and driving housing. And uh, I'm just um, thrilled to be, actually, this is only the second event that I've had the opportunity to be at of any scale uh, since we uh, have come out of um, the second wave of COVID. So good morning to you all. So if you're a visitor, I want to take the opportunity to welcome you to the most livable part of the most livable place in the world. And of course, if you're one of our, us Victorians, I want to say how good it is to see you again back in the city. As we know, the first two years of COVID have been tough, tough on Australia, but even tougher here in Victoria. But we stuck together. We kept the worst of the pandemic from spreading to the rest of the country in 2020. And we're now on the other side of the Omicron peak. The pandemic isn't over, of course, by any stretch, but lives have been saved and progress, of course, has been made. We've made progress 
thanks to the sacrifices of everyday Australians who wore their masks and lined up for vaccines and followed the public health advice. We've made progress, thanks of course, to the extraordinary miracle of medical science, from the vaccine researchers to the public health experts, and of course to the magnificent uh, medical professionals who every day, through the worst days of this, put themselves at risk and on the line. And we absolutely call out the splendid work, the courageous work of our medical professionals in our hospital system. But all of this, of course, does beg the question of what now? What lessons have the past two years taught us? How should we go about putting those hard lessons into practice? And I want to try to answer those questions, but first I want to do something else. So usually I acknowledge first up the traditional owners of the land and their elders. Uh, for the record, of course, today, the traditional owners are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, and of course, we, we wish Uncle Ringo Terek uh, a, a full and complete recovery, and we're sorry that uh, he can't be with us today. But today, I wanted to start by telling you a story about Enterprise Park. Now, Enterprise Park marks a spot where Melbourne's first European settlers landed in 1835. As such, it's the epicentre of so much of the suffering that followed. Enterprise Park is a small patch of land wedged between Flinders Street and the Yarra. It's basically just on the other side of the river there. Enterprise Park uh, is a place that is incredibly significant to our First Nations people. You can walk to Enterprise Park from here follow South Bank towards the MCG and cross the river at Queen's Bridge. And that's where you'll find a piece of public sculpture called Scar. Scar, which was developed by Wiradjuri artist Kimber Thompson in conjunction with eight Victorian Aboriginal artists, is made up of 30 poles. These poles represent scar trees and are painted to tell stories of dispossession, violence and survival. And if you have the time, cross the river and have a look at the scar. It's worth your time. But what else does Enterprise Park represent? And what does it have to do with a pandemic uh, and indeed this housing conference today, this next couple of days? In a word, it is persistence. Aboriginal Victorians, starting with Wurundjeri elder William Barrack, resisted two centuries of stolen generations and tempted assimilation and indeed annihilation. They fought for their culture, their identity and self-determination. And now I'm thrilled to say we are negotiating a treaty. The only state in Australia negotiating a treaty with its First Nations people. <laughs> and against the odds, Aboriginal Victorians have endured and they will succeed. Which brings me back to the lessons of the pandemic. Coming out of the hardships of the past two years, those of us who see housing, as all of you do, as a fundamental human right, should learn from the successes that come from endurance and persistence. And let me explain what I mean by endurance and persistence. As some of you know, I've been around the community, social and public housing for a little while. My father worked over the road here in the docks. I started out as an inner city social worker working in the high rise towers at Flemington. And of course, I worked for one of Australia's greatest urban reformers, uh, the Honourable Brian Howe, former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and of course, the architect of Ahuri. Uh, and it is to the enduring uh, uh, legacy of Brian uh, that Ahuri not only was created by Brian, but of course has thrived now for uh, many, well, a number of decades. Uh, and, and the essence of what Brian was seeking to create there was the opportunity for discourse, the opportunity for people to meet together, uh, and the opportunity to learn from each other, to network with each other, and to develop really strong social policy. Uh, and 
if I've learnt anything in my career, it, it is essentially uh, the crucial importance of those relationships that you develop, uh, but also that you learn uh, from some of the good, really forward-thinking uh, people who are in this room today. Um, and I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Brian's contribution to housing reform, uh, which does endure to today. So back in 2006, during my first go around as, as housing minister, I delivered a $500 million investment in affordable housing. And we also delivered the Common Ground um, project, which of course was all about giving homeless people the support they need to get off the streets, housing and wraparound services. But no, and no doubt many of you in the room here today, of course, and I've seen so many of my friends here today as we came in, have similar stories of reforms fought for and won of individual lives that have been transformed. But despite all of that good work, the numbers are not going the way that we need. More people can't afford to buy a home. More are renting. More are struggling to pay their rent. More are waiting for public housing. And of course, more are homeless. These tell us, I think, two things. We cannot simply rely on the market. And secondly, uh, systems reform is clearly needed. But delivering systemic reform does require persistence and endurance. And our government has been working to deliver this systemic reform for a number of years. Obviously, for starters, we've invested $5.3 billion in the big housing build. And between 2020 and 2024, the big housing build will deliver uh, potentially up to 15,000 700 new, new homes across metropolitan Melbourne and regional Victoria, creating in excess of 40,000 jobs and changing lives. Now, I've spoken about this before, but it, it is important to, uh, I think, acknowledge that this is the largest commitment ever made by a state or federal government uh, to the provision of public and social housing by either a Commonwealth or indeed a state government. And I'm immensely proud of what the government has achieved. But it's, it's actually about three things. It's about, obviously, the provision of supply, uh, but it's also about ensuring that we do target uh, this housing to those who are in most need. We had the Mental Health Royal Commission, as you know, and we are targeting more than 1,000 properties directly to people on the waiting list uh, who are suffering the challenges of mental health, uh, women and children escaping domestic violence, and, of course, our First Nations people as well. Uh, in, in the first instance will be the priorities for the supply of housing. What we've also done, though, is to, uh, to uh, split the funding in a way that spreads right across the state. So $1.25 billion of this is going directly into regional Victoria uh, for all the obvious reasons uh, to address supply, but also it is incredibly important in terms of uh, lifting the economies in regional Victoria, so it's about good social outcome uh, and good uh, economic outcome in terms of investment and jobs. And uh, I think there is no better investment that a government can make than in, in this uh, really important area of public policy. All the new homes, of course, will be seven star efficiency rated. And, uh, and when we're done, Victoria's total housing supply will be boosted by uh, roughly 10%. Uh, and almost 6,000 of those new properties are already underway. But of course, the big housing build is not enough. We know housing needs systemic change. And that's why we established Homes Victoria as a steward of social, affordable and public housing. We've finalised a 10-year social and affordable housing strategy to maximise the long-term benefits of the big housing build. And we're looking to identify enduring and sustainable mechanisms for growth. And that's why this conference in the next couple of days is so important to us. Obviously, all of, um, all of the key players in Homes Victoria will be here. Not only will they be contributing, but they'll be listening as well, because we're always open to listen to new ideas and new reform opportunities. But of course, not every reform sticks, but, and that's politics. But I'd rather try and I'll keep trying. 
because what's the alternative? So you don't hold a hose, claim credit for everything and responsibility for nothing. That's the modus operandi of some, but it's not us. Uh, is it the best we can do that uh, if you want to access housing, that you have to drain your super, super, superannuation funds, and particularly for uh, older women, uh, that this is the best we can do in terms of housing policy? Uh, we're not in the business of uh, letting people fall through the net like that. Um, and we are particularly, uh, as a government, concerned for older women. O older women who've had, uh, who've had disrupted employment, uh, older women who uh, have had minimal superannuation, who we, who, find, who we find, through no fault of their own, uh, rendered into poverty and homelessness. That's completely unacceptable. And frankly, that's not the Australian way, and that's not the way anyone in this room would accept. That's why our government will, will keep trying for social and economic progress and keep looking for the next step forward. And homelessness is a good example of our practical approach uh, which we are seeking to address. So during the first lockdown, we took 1,845 rough sleepers off the street and we put them into hotels. We also promised to find long-term accommodation for those 1,845 homeless people. And so far, we've found housing, long-term housing, for 1,500 of these rough sleepers, and we're working our way through the remaining balance of about 345. And at the end of the most recent lockdown, around 250 families with children were also staying in hotels because they had obviously nowhere to go. And again, we're going to find, we are going to find housing for those 250 families as well. And that'll take 400 children, 400 children out of homelessness. Finding housing for our fellow Victorians, of course, is hard work. And, you know, we made some mistakes. We made some mistakes um, in, in the program and, and we readily admit that um, some of the housing we sought to, uh, sought to uh, put people into was not appropriate for them. But what we did understand absolutely was a housing first approach and the critical importance of wraparound services to support people uh, on their journey back uh, was absolutely crucial because people don't choose homelessness as a life. It's not a lifestyle choice that people make to say, oh, well, you know, I think, I'm gonna, I think homelessness seems a pretty good option for me. No, it's not. Uh, people render the, are rendered into homelessness for a multiplicity of reasons. You all know that. I don't need to tell you that. Um, whether it's mental health, drug and alcohol, family violence, you, you, know, you know all of the characteristics of, of homelessness, but I'm immensely proud of what we've done. I mean, we, will, we, we are the only state in Australia that's, that's doing this housing intervention at scale. And, uh, you know, yes, we, made some, we have made some mistakes uh, uh, through the journey, but our goal has always been to ensure we put our best effort into ensuring that we don't just provide housing, but we actually support, uh, provide the supports that people need to maintain their tenancy going forward. Um, and, you know, frankly, uh, this is absolutely worth the effort. So looking ahead, our government will keep striving to make Victoria fairer and safer, more accessible and affordable, more livable and sustainable. We'll keep listening to and talking to people and, and keep working to find solutions that are absolutely in the public interest. And that's why to this next couple of days is so important to me, so important to, my, uh, to the staff of, of Homes Vic. We will persist so that every day Victorians can endure and succeed. And that's what we will do. That's what comes after COVID-19 and frankly, that's why we will never give up. Please enjoy your conference. Thank you.